Okay, this video is called The Art of Chivalry, and we're just going to show some paintings to do with the knights, King Arthur, and that sort of thing, and Charlemagne. Okay, because the art is beautiful, and there's some interesting stories behind art history that go with this. So first of all, we can start off with the beginning of the Middle Ages, the Sack of Rome. This is the Sack of Rome in 455 A.D., but really, you know, 476 A.D. was sort of like about the end of it, okay? And you can see, you know, women just don't have the upper body strength that a man does. A woman's about as strong as a boy is in 6th or 7th grade. That way she can control her sons until they hit puberty, then they go off to with the men to do what the men do. Okay, I think part of the reason why the United States is being so heavily feminized is because it's being groomed for slavery. There's no such thing as a gynocracy that can defend itself from the outside world. Men, women are very smart. They've got better social skills than men, better social intelligence than men. I can tell you, whenever I have a social problem, I always go talk to a woman because she'll understand it better than me. Uh, but, you know, in terms of defending a country... Men are better at that, okay? And I don't know, that shouldn't be a, a complicated thing to say. Um, and this was the sack of Rome. There's been numerous similar stories. Okay. So now here is the beginning of the King Arthur story. After Rome collapsed, the Rome previously guarded all kinds of areas, like they were in Britain, for example. When they left out of Britain, then the, the Brits were vulnerable to other uh, groups coming in, like the Saxons, for example, and other countries had similar problems. And so you'll hear, like, I remember it started coming out these words back when I, in the 1980s, you know, toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity. And I believe that's really sort of a psyop being played on the American public, toxic masculinity. You need masculinity, okay? Masculinity gets a lot of work done, all right? Um, and I would say you need noble masculinity. And that's what one of the great things about chivalry. And that's what we're going to talk about, chivalry, the knights. They didn't always follow the rules, but they were supposed to follow the rules. It's basically a Christian way of doing things, but also being brave and strong and good. So here's King Arthur getting ready to pull, the, take the sword from the Lady of the Lake. N.C. Wyeth did a whole bunch of really nice illustrations on the, the King Arthur stuff. Okay, here's King Arthur's a round table, you know, and again, the round table, the idea that each knight was respected in his own position is not so strictly hierarchical, even though, of course, King Arthur was still the boss. And there's a vision of the Holy Grail in the center, and they wanted to get a piece of that Holy Grail. The Holy Grail was based on, you know, Christ's wounds. He was pierced in the chest by a long lance by Longinus, the, you know, Roman centurion. And then blood, actually water came out too. It's a long story why blood and water both came out. But the, it was collected in a cup, and that cup was the Holy Grail. And it's thought to have incredible healing powers. And then there was this quest to find the Holy Grail. Okay, and getting back to the idea of, you know, noble masculinity, the knight. You know, he was expected to learn his trade and to be brave and uh, do what he was supposed to do. Let me see if I can shrink my picture here. All right, and these pictures are just beautiful, okay? Um, you, If you look at the art, especially the art of the 1800s, the vast majority of the greatest paintings ever made in the history of the world came out of the 1800s because they sort of had that Christian mindset, but they also had a lot of freedom. And it was sort of a time when monarchies were transitioning into different types of uh, ruling groups. Uh, but anyways, you can see, you know, a young devoted guy with, you know, if you get him to follow the, the chivalry, then they can do a lot of good for a country. Okay, and the pictures are just magnificent, okay? Look how great these pictures are. Um, this is the painting, The Accolade by Edmund Leighton. He was a follower of the pre-Raphaelite group of painters in England. We talked about them before. You know, uh, John Everett Millay was sort of the best known of them. And John Ruskin had promoted them. He was the, great, the greatest... Uh, art critic and art historian of all time in England in the mid-1800s. And then these young followers of them. It was an idea of making art more realistic, more detailed, um, lifelike, and it's just magnificent. So the accolade right here. I mean, it's just like it's, you, you couldn't imagine that painted better than it is. And here's the dedication, okay? And it's, it's sort of been the role of the knight to love and protect his woman, okay? That's how it is, all right? Um and it's beautiful. I just love these pictures. They're fantastic. Okay, and then here is Sir Galahad. And Sir Galahad was um, 
the knight who was the most pure. And he's, of course, in contrast to Lancelot. Lancelot was the best fighter of all the knights, but he was also in the mischief, you know, fooling around with Guinevere, and he had some other... Ooh, I forgot to put this other light on here, and I forgot to put the white towel behind my chair. I don't have my act together here. All right, well, anyways, and of course, this picture's kind of funny. It has some innuendo in it, and I like the Cairo is for Jesus Christ, and then up here, this is the Celtic cross with the circle being like the sun, if you will, being like eternity goes in a circle, also making it sturdier to support it so it's less likely to break. Um, <clears throat> and there's also, like, the idea of Celtic... Catholic Christianity in Ireland um, versus the later, you know, originally England was Catholic too, but it later became Anglican Christianity, you know, run by Henry VIII. Okay, here is Sir Galahad on his quest to find the Holy Grail, and only he could find the Holy Grail because he was worthy. Lancelot had made himself unworthy with his behavior. And that's partly too why this became so popular. <clears throat> There's other countries that had written stories of knights and stuff, but I think what made King Arthur so popular was all the, the romances in it, you know, like Tristan and Isolt and, um, you know, Lancelot and Guinevere and all this stuff. Um, so it's very entertaining. I remember I really enjoyed reading it. I read all these, a uh, whole bunch of stuff about the King Arthur stories. I took courses on it. I enjoyed the whole thing. TheGreatCourses.com has a really good course on... Um, on uh, King Arthur and all the King Arthur stories. It's quite good. And there's books, um, like I think it's, I don't know if it's Bullfinch or something, um, Mythology, it's an audio CD course. I really enjoyed that too. So here's uh, Lancelot sleeping and the four princesses are approaching him. There's all kinds of funny stories like that. But, you know, if you have to compare <coughs> Greek mythology to the Lancelot stories, Greek mythology is way better. It's way more intellectual and deep and thoughtful. This is a lot. Okay, here's Galahad in the Castle of the Maidens, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, had a real funny uh, parody of this situation. You know, Galahad the good, the worthy, to find the Holy Grail and finds himself in a castle full of maidens. Okay, um, here's the Two Crowns by Frank Dixie. He was a good uh, illustrator, again, in that 1800s tradition. And again, the idea of the Two Crowns. There's the king with a secular worldly power, and then there's Christ. Uh, with religious power, if you will, and the king must and should respect it if you're going to have a good country. And that's what's great for the people. They have an outside appeal beyond the ruler, okay, and it gives them more freedom and gives them more status in their society. Christianity is the friend of the poor man. Okay, here's the painting about the death of King Arthur, and the whole King Arthur story was, you know, he was a good and noble guy, and he had some problems, obviously, and they were kind of sad, but you, there's a lot to be learned from reading the stories. They do a they do a pretty good job of capturing human nature. They're not as subtle and nuanced as uh, the Greeks, but there's it's still great. I mean, it's still well worth a person's time to learn all about King Arthur. A lot of times, if you want to learn something, it's helpful to maybe watch a movie first, get some visual images in your mind, um, and then you can you know listen to the audiobooks or read the books if you've got the time. Um, it's good to have that background information. And, you know, the first thing people should learn is the Bible. Everything sort of starts with the Bible. So you should learn the common stories of the Bible. And then you should learn Greek mythology, um, a little bit of history, whatever you're interested in, and then reading these things too. So here's, you know, the death of King Arthur again as well. Um, the good king, the noble king. And so, like I said, noble masculinity is what makes a society good for everybody. Men are just naturally inclined to um, want to protect and serve, okay? I can tell you as a guy, like I said, I saw my parents were happy. It was programmed in my mind. I find a woman to marry, I marry her, we have kids, and then it's like my job to provide for her, to protect her, to do all these things for her. It's just automatic, you, you don't think about it. And it's like anytime you have a girlfriend, you kind of like put her on a pedestal and you want to do everything for her. We can't help it as a man, as a heterosexual man, Christian man, we're programmed that way. It's not like I can control it. It's just how I'm programmed, how I think. Um, and if a woman cheats on you, then what you think is, like I had a girlfriend one time who cheated on me, you know, many years ago, and it made me think, gosh, she's still super attractive and I would like to sleep with her, but I never thought of her again as a potential wife. I sort of like, she was a girlfriend because I didn't have any other girlfriend, but I didn't I didn't love her anymore, and I didn't I didn't put her on a pedestal anymore. She was just nice to have a girlfriend sometimes when I'm lonely, but I didn't. It's like my total way of thinking about her changed because when you're thinking she's my future wife, she's on a pedestal, she's everything, and you'll do anything for her. Um, so, anyways, it's good for a woman, you know, 
keep your man appreciating you in that way and he'll do anything for you you know that's women kind of control us more than might be in our best interest We're just program that way okay but just showing more of these pictures here's saint elizabeth she was actually the daughter of a king but she chose to dedicate her life to helping the poor she became a saint she was a member of the secular order of the franciscans so you could be you know not a nun or a priest or whatever and still be in all these religious orders you're just the secular part of the order and so she did lots of good deeds for the people and christianity appreciates that you can do anything you want, and anybody can be a Christian. You just say, "I want to be a Christian." You know, it doesn't you don't have to go through a gauntlet or any you don't have to take a quiz or anything. You just say it, and you are. Uh, so, anyways, beautiful painting. And once again, Edmund Layton, all, and he's you know another like I said, pre-Raphaelite brotherhood uh, disciple, if you will, acolyte trainee, and he made magnificent after magnificent paintings. They're just extraordinary. I think he's up, up there as you know among the best artists of all time. This guy, Edmund Layton. Okay, and um, Here's another painting that I think is kind of funny. Okay, well, first of all, here's a lady stitching the standard. You know, this is a very beautiful woman here uh, making the flag there. And, you know, kind of like perfect looking woman there. All right, and then what I'm trying to say here is um, this one right here, the king and the beggar maid. This is the idea of men being more romantic than women. And men are more romantic than women in the sense that if a guy loves a woman, he doesn't care very much most of the time where she comes from or any of that kind of stuff. He just loves her, yes or no. And she could be poor. He doesn't expect her to ever make 10 cents in her life. That's normal too. Whereas a woman, I don't think, and you know, John Zerga had joked that men are more romantic than women. She doesn't want to marry a man who's lower status than her. She's embarrassed. She doesn't want to marry a man who's shorter than her. She's embarrassed. She doesn't want a man who, you know, has less status than her or less money than her. She'd be embarrassed. I don't know how to explain it, but... A guy sees a, a woman, a lot more potential woman, as a suitable mate for him than she sees as suitable for herself. Okay, that was like the old thing at the 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 online dating thing. I heard that the women think that 85% of the men are ugly. They're only interested in about 15% of the men, if that many. Versus with the men, it's the opposite. They think about 85% of the women are reasonably attractive. The woman will put something in there like, "I want you know any potential." Uh, date for me to be over six feet tall, make at least $100,000 a year, have at least, you know, a college degree or a master's degree or something like that versus, and that's why a lot of them never find anybody versus the guy. He's like, well, let me see. Let me see what I'm looking at here. I don't know. We'll see. A lot more open-minded about a lot of things. Okay, here's just more great paintings. This one is Meeting on the Turret Stairs. This is the most famous painting ever in the history of Ireland uh, by Frederick William Burton. It's the most popular painting. was voted on all the paintings. You know, Daniel McLeese was also a great uh, painter from Ireland. But there's not that many good painters from Ireland. you got to be kind of wealthy to be a good painter. you got to have time, leisure time, to sit there and practice the skill. It's a very difficult skill to become this great at it. Um, so there's, in Ireland, they're all poor. You know, there's not many good painters from poor uh, places. There's also not that many good painters from hot places. I don't know if the weather has something to do with it. Basically, you're sitting around inside with nothing else to do, so you start drawing and painting, okay? Um, the next thing is Godspeed right here. This is by Edmund Layton again. It's just another magnificent painting, and this, the, you know, the sad reality of it. The guys are going off, and you don't know if they're coming back. You know, it's kind of scary. But toxic masculinity, you know, it's noble masculinity. It keeps the place free and safe for everybody. All right, so here's just another painting. This is another one of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, Edward Byrne Jones, and he made some really good paintings, and you totally get the feel of it here, you know. They love each other. They're sad. They're leaving. They hope they come back, and it's life, you know. Sometimes, too, I'll talk to, you know, college students, grad students, and they're whining about having a quiz, you know, on Friday, and I'm like, dude, you're lucky, you know. Ever since the beginning of time, young guys have been working as peasants in the fields all day long, or they've been sent out to the front line, often not coming back, so... Your job of having to twirl a pencil around is a pretty good deal, all things considered. Okay, another again, here's another Edmund Layton painting, you know, just magnificent, totally captures the moment of them having to flee, you know, there's probably some tyrannical ruler coming after them, you know. And for example, I just recently uh, saw, you know, a movie about the life of Christ, Jesus and Nazareth, and there was a whole story about, you know, Massacre of the Innocents with regard to King Herod wanting to remove all the potential. Uh, persons that might take over his crown and what I'm trying to say is people think that doesn't go on anymore it goes on like every day you just don't know it you don't understand it 
if you actually read current events more carefully, you will see that sort of thing happens all day, every day. Okay, um, and it's sad, but it's good to you know be in touch with reality. In my experience, most people kind of can't handle reality, and you can't really talk about it with them because they get so offended. And basically, I think of like two separate histories. And Arthur Schopenhauer had pointed this out. The history of art and creativity and literature and architecture, it's all beautiful and you see these wonderful achievements and they're inspiring and they're good and it makes you happy. Okay, But then when you read about the history of power in politics and stuff, it's just disgusting. It's evil, dishonest, it's brutal, but it's still it's good to know about that because that's a big part of how the world works. You, know, you don't want to personally be involved in it if you can possibly avoid it, but you should know something about it because that's how the world really works. Okay, and this is another thing too that was nice. You know, by the knights making the roads safe, people could go on pilgrimages, and that's a big thing in Catholicism: is pilgrimages to to shrines, to places where there's relics, to famous churches and stuff. And that created a lot of trade, led to a lot of prosperity in the Middle Ages. You know, Protestantism pretty much shut all that stuff down. Oh, and when I used this painting in a previous talk, I made a joke about people take a pilgrimage to go to the CAT scanner in a hospital. Yeah, but still, another beautiful painting, and it alludes, you know, there's the wife of Bath. This is from the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer and stuff, you know, Juan that I April, all that stuff. Okay, here is the crowning of Charlemagne, crowned by the Pope right here. And a great thing about Charlemagne, he had a... a one of his advisors was named Alquin, and Alquin was great at education. And Charlemagne did a heck of a lot to help educate the people under his rule and to sort of unify different areas of Europe and really make it a lot more educated. I remember when I went to Montessori, it was called Alquin Montessori after Charlemagne's advisor. And then I love uh, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas really dug deep into studying the ancient Greeks and proving that you know faith and reason are not contradictory they go together you got much better science much better reason in the context of faith because it pressures you to be honest okay um, versus atheism just pressures you do whatever is going to help your group to make more money you know and, and it's it's created a disaster in modern science modern science and medicines become a joke okay uh, because of the atheistic Darwinism whereby the patient is irrelevant. No one cares about the patients because they have no money. So anyways, I love uh, Thomas Aquinas and he's syncretic. He sort of unified multiple different things like Aristotelianism with Catholicism, Christianity and reason and science. And it really, his scholasticism school um, sort of opened things up to, uh, lead, led to the Renaissance really, you know, all that was good about that. And the other thing, too, is, you know, you look at these uh, guys back around, you know, 1200, 1300, 1400. They built all these cathedrals. You know, you should say to yourself, isn't that amazing? These are the most beautiful buildings ever made in the history of the world. The coolest buildings, the most individualistic, the most beautiful, the most awesome and impressive. Why is it that the best architecture was done, you know, 600 years ago. How come we can't equal that anymore? Because our metaphysics are messed up. Art is a concretization of metaphysics. That's what Ayn Rand said, and she's absolutely right. Okay, here's just another beautiful painting of a cathedral here. And, you know, all the cathedrals are beautiful. Some more, than, not all of them, but most of them are. Oops, I don't know how I did that. Let me get back to where I was. Okay, and then these, well, a big part of the reason why these cathedrals were so beautiful was the purpose would be for teaching. So they might have somebody in the center, whoever that is. I can't even see in this one right here. Maybe it's Jesus. Maybe it's um, this lady, by the way, Amy Balog. She's got a great Twitter page. Um, it's all, just look up her name. She, she just has a knack for finding beautiful art. Um, when the soul of a man is illuminated by God, great art is born. Okay, and this is the rose window at Shark Cathedral. And there will often be some central theme here, and then all these uh, drawings around it will be related to that central theme, whatever it might be, and these will be the famous saints and whatnot. And this is how the illiterate people of these parishes at the time, that's how they were taught about the history of Christianity and the Bible. And it was a very useful thing, and it's entertaining to look at these pictures. Okay, and the, you know, the, the sculpture, the carving on the doors, you know, the three doors, you know, one to the past, the present, the future, 
Um, they're just magnificent. It goes on and on. And then, you know, the, the craftsmen, the artisans who crafted these things, each one was individually trying to make something beautiful, but they didn't even sign them at that time. But they're so magnificent. They're great. I mean, look at that. All kinds of good things. And the illustrations inside were like a comic book, you know, led the invention of the comic book. And a lot of stuff on the outside might be monsters and devils and griffins, you know, showing how the outside world can be versus the inside world is better. But it just goes on and on, the creativity of all these statues and stuff. And what an individualistic thing to let people carve all this stuff on the outside of a building. And all the towns would compete to see who could have the best, um, the best cathedral. So it was a thing of great pride for a community to have a beautiful cathedral in their town and you know i've talked about ayn rand and aristotle before you know he's the greatest philosopher who ever lived he's plato did lots of great things but aristotle was better aristotle was more objective down to earth fair and reasonable okay so ayn rand calls aristotle the philosophical atlas who carries the whole western civilization on his shoulders whenever intellectual progress of men Whatever intellectual progress men have rests on the achievements of Aristotle. He is the cultural barometer of Western history. Whenever his influence dominated, it paved the way for one of history's brilliant eras. And when it fell, so did mankind. Aristotle is the father of individualism. So that's a great thing. And part of that comes from, you know, <clears throat> here's Aristotle and here's Plato. It, it, Plato's pointing up to the forms up in the sky. And after Spartan, the Spartans defeated Athens in the Peloponnesian War, then <clears throat> Plato kind of gave more favoritism to Sparta than it deserved. And <clears throat> that's sort of a collectivist society. And he sort of only wanted the guardians, you know, the philosopher guardian kings to have true freedom intellectually. Um, versus Aristotle <clears throat> was much more open-minded towards, you know, people getting educated and pursuing their own interests. Um, <clears throat> Ayn Rand had another good quote. She said, the smallest uh, minority is the individual. Okay, and if you respect the individual then everything good happens for a society. And this is a beautiful painting here, one of the greatest paintings of all time, The School of Athens by Raphael. Okay, I actually have a copy of this painting, a big poster of it in my bathroom. I always like to put great things in my bathroom that I see them every day because it inspires me to have more energy to try to do whatever I'm trying to achieve and you know all kinds of great things. Here's Socrates talking to Alcibiades and a couple others and Raphael painted himself into this uh, painting, etc. It's magnificent from the... Vatican. And then here is sort of uh, a little bit of the concept like Caspar David Friedrich. This is painted by Viktor Vaznetsov. You know, I think he was a great Russian painter, you know, back in the 1800s when Russia was great before they fell apart. And the point is, here's the knight. He looks a little tired. He's found himself at a fork in the road. has to decide which way to go. And that's like ourselves. We have to decide what are we going to do next? Where are we going to put our energy and our efforts? And I think to some extent we're coming to this sort of uh, fork in the road. Are we going to be united with Bible ethics and be nice to each other and help each other and make our society good? Or are we going to be factionalized like a bunch of chumps and accept all this atheistic Darwinism BS and let ourselves be psyoped into feminization of all the men and pushed into a modern version of slavery? So right now, <clears throat> it seems like we're headed down this path really much more than anyone would wish. And it might be really difficult to turn back. But hopefully <clears throat> we'll be able to restore freedom and give everybody a chance at having a good life. Hopefully we'll <clears throat> be able to accomplish that. And then here's a nice painting by one of the Pre-Raphaelites. This is William Holman Hunt. It's Christ knocks on the outside of the door. There's no handle on the door. You can't open the door from the outside. You have to let him in. And hopefully society will. And then we could <clears throat> be nicer to each other. Um, and be more honest about a lot of things. Uh, hopefully it'll happen. Who knows? So anyways, hope this was interesting.